Wow, well, it's, it's kind of hard to believe that I'm actually here. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's a real, it's a huge honor. And uh, I'm having a ball. I'm having the time of my life discovering. It's the first time in Canada. I can't believe I've left it this long. Uh, but it's about time. So I'm a late bloomer, I guess. And um, thank you. And really enjoying uh, Victoria. I think you have the coolest coffee shops in the world. <laughs> And um, I plan to have something in each one of them. It's a coffee shop crawl coming up. And, the, and you're all invited, by the way. It was, it was in your handouts. Um, I wanted to also say, I, for all the places I've been to around the world, and, and, uh, and I look at their parliament buildings, because I like architecture. That's what, apparently, I like architecture. It says that on my intro. So I went there yesterday. I've never seen a parliament building that has the Christmas lights still on. <laughs> and I figured that a place that has a parliament building that's lit up like a Christmas tree, something must be going right. <laughs> well, at least, at least on the outside of the building. Okay? What goes on on the inside is... Don't worry, it's the same down south. No, it's not. It's a lot worse. And so, love, fear, and shame in education. Let me see if I can find... This is what I needed. I don't need this microphone. <laughs> Up a little bit. Can you hear me? I'll put this thing away. This is a, a roving microphone for questions later, so... Oh, excuse me a moment. Just getting comfortable. Okay. Um, so you can hear me clearly enough. Um, what time do I need to get off? Remind me. I just want to make sure I get to the punchline on, on time. At 10.30, fantastic. Let's see if we can have some fun. Love, fear, and shame in education. What is it fundamentally, what is the secret to what motivates children. In fact, what's the secret to what motivates human beings? Children and big children. The rest of us. Do you know somebody that looks a little bit like this? <laughs> what gets us to want to learn and relearn and rehearse and master things? And, and uh, this, is not, this is a rhetorical question. Um, hold your horses for a minute. Don't, you, you'll get to be excited later on. Um, you know somebody that looks a bit like this sometimes? Including ourselves. And what makes us want to work? What makes us want to work? Let's underline that word. <laughs> Are you familiar with this guy? Anyone seen this guy? Nobody knows this guy. You do? What's his name? Call it out. Alfie Cohn, one of my heroes. And um, this is a quote from Alfie Cohn, and I love this quote so much. It's my favorite quote in the world. So I want to read it out to you. Maybe we can all read it together, but we should have rehearsed. Anyway, here it is. There is a time to admire the grace and the persuasive power of an influential idea. And there is a time to fear its hold over us. The time to worry is when the idea is so widely shared that we no longer even notice it, when it is so deeply rooted that it feels to us like plain common sense. At the point when objections are not even answered anymore because they're no longer even raised, we are no longer in control. We do not have the idea, it has us. So, and this applies to so many things culturally. So what, is, what are perhaps some of the deepest held assumptions about what drives learning and work that are so deeply and, 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 and collectively shared that we don't even know that they're assumptions anymore? And I now want to suggest what that might be. 
the thingy will work. Have you heard this said? Yeah. Usually by the holder of a wagging finger. That child needs more discipline. Do we say that sometimes? But, but this is so, this perspective is voiced all across the world. And it has been voiced for generations. Wouldn't surprise me if the ancient Greeks and Romans, etc., would say the same thing. This is discipline. <laughs> it involves a carrot and a stick. That's, that's all of your educational tools right there. So this is what discipline is. You take the, the stuff that you like and you offer it a carrot. And you look at the behavior that you don't like and you offer it some kind of a stick. And um, have you heard of behaviorism in, as a school of thought in psychology? And so since behaviorism got very popular in the 1950s, if anything, the carrot and the stick um, became more widely uh, respected, more widely used. So psychologists have a lot to answer for. But where I come from in Australia, I think the majority of people don't even have a question about the carrot and the stick. Except as you'll see later on, it's very modern now to say, well, we don't use the stick anymore. We just get an extra carrot or two. We're the carrot people. <laughs> and we're very proud of that. So this is the kind of thing that the stick would have looked like. That's a punishment stool. Now, please don't worry, I'm not associating this, I'm not saying that schools are like this now. But it's always interesting to look at, um, I, look, I love looking at the history of education, the history of parenting, because we look at those roots in, in, in our shared perspective, the roots of our, uh, our shared thinking, the collective thinking. And, and, and suddenly you, 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 you see it, Differently, you see it as if it's an option rather than a given. And psychohistorians have looked at, they've looked far and wide and looked at every image depicting a school teacher from the past, from the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, and ancient, the ancient world. A teacher is always seen holding a stick of some kind, a birch. That is the fear in the title of my talk, Love, Shame and Fear in Education. What does that mean for us today that the principal instrument of discipline has been this instrument of violence? What has that left us with? Were you aware that your neighbours south of the border in 19 of the 50 states it is still allowed for teachers to use that instrument. Did you know that? They paddle the, the children on the buttocks. It's still legal in 19 states. Do you want to take a guess at wh what states they are? <laughs> Go online if you have the stomach for it and look at a documentary that was just made. It's called The Board of Education. And that's the board. But their belief is, is, is so deep that there isn't even a question, just like Alfie Cohn said. How do you get children motivated to behave well unless you use fear? And this is what fear does to our capacity to learn. It overactivates the emotional um, centers of the brain, the limbic system, and puts the rational thinking, focused thought part of the brain, the, these, these frontal lobes, it pulls the plug on that, on that machine. We can't think straight, literally. We cannot absorb nor retain information when we are in fear. Now, of course, um, oh, I should tell you, in the so-called developed world, there remain only two nations where it's still permissible for teachers to hit students. 
Australia is one of them, although now it is very, very, very rare. Uh, just a few independent religious schools. Most of the states, it's illegal now, but in the state of Queensland, Western Australia, I think in the Northern Territory, some schools are still allowed. Uh, some of them brag about it in their website. Uh, and the United States is the second one. So fear shuts down thinking, learning, and memory. It's, it, it puts the brakes on learning. It diminishes our potential. Safety in the classroom, in every learning environment. But by that I mean emotional safety. But when I talk about punishment, I don't think by any means that is the only uh, provoker of fear in a student. There is so much more that is frightening. In fact, let's do a quick little survey with hands up. How many of you remember, and, and I do acknowledge that there's been a tremendous shift in evolution in what education looks like and feels like since our generation, when I say our generation, I'm sort of flattering myself a little bit. Everybody over 21. <laughs> um, there has been, no, that's not even true though. Everybody say over 30 or 40. There's been a tremendous shift in what a classroom feels like. Is that true for Canada? Yeah. Huge. So how many of you, those of you that are a little bit over 30, put your hand up. Do you remember being afraid of your teacher? Keep your hand up and look around the room. Your teacher, the school principal. What about when you hear the words now, I want to see you in my office? <laughs> what does that do? Just to hear those words. I still panic because I know that I'm in trouble. You don't tend to expect, you know, a lovely, like a hug. Um, exams. Do you know that they did, um, there was a study I heard about recently. I went to a conference about the relationship between the gut and the brain. This is really opening up right now. They did this incredible uh, study on medicine, students of medicine at university, and they found that moments before the exam, when they, they do the medical exam at the end of the year, they lose all of the, the gut flora. Um, one strand uh, in particular, lactobacillus acidophilus. Have you heard that one? It's in your yogurt, but it's also in our gut, and it's fundamental to immune health, mood, our, our so-called mental, what medicine wheel, mental emotional health is so dependent on, on, on a balance of the gut flora that when we're in fear, the gut flora starts to disappear. Did you know that? So here we are trying to do an exam that will determine our future, and we're terrified. But we now understand that part of your brain just switches off in fear. I think a little bit of stress can be quite optimal. But there is, Alfie Cohn, by the way, he, he's, a, he's a psychology something or other from Harvard University. He's a professor there. And um, he tours the world. He's, done, he, he, he's into education. He reads every single study ever done. He says, no homework. This is true for primary school and and um, junior high school, no homework, no exams, no grades equals better learning. That's so, oh wow. I was scared when I was, when I was gonna say that. I didn't know what kind of, because I, remember I haven't been here before. There's probably another way to do exams. Maybe it can be called a quiz and make it really, really fun. But I'll talk more about that later. 
Are you starting to think of questions, by the way? Good. Don't forget them because we'll need you at the end with your questions. Let's talk about shame. Do you know what I think? And I learn more about this as I do a lot of, um, I run workshops for parents a lot around all around Australia and all of the other places I'm supposed to have been to. And whenever I talk about parenting, I become more and more aware of how frightening it is to hear about it, how uncomfortable. It presses so many buttons. The fact, even to be, uh, to hear the suggestion that there's something to learn, I think it already pushes a little button about shame. And that's not just true about parenting. That's about it, everything that is really dear to us, everything important. Do you relate to that? That moment that you realize that you need to learn something new and there's another human being in front of you that might teach it to you. It's a, it's a, it's a tender moment. Uh, you might feel a little bit vulnerable. So it's not necessarily that that is a moment of shame, but I think that quite universally that is a moment where we're vulnerable to shame. Where, where whoever has that uh, teacher role for that moment in your life needs to be sensitive to that. How do you feel about that? Is that true for you? I think we need to pay a lot of attention to that. Here's what shame does. Oh, teachers, there's a few of you here today. How do you like that question? Will that be in the exam, miss? What does that mean when somebody asks that? Do, do I care if I'm your student? Do I care about the content? Or am I just frightened about if I'll be examined? Hey, try this out for a moment. Pay attention to, to your body right now. Emotions, sensations. Just go inside. What's the first thing that moves through you if I said to you, you're about to be examined? Call it out. What happens? How does that feel when you hear those words? Your heart rate increases. Your heart rate increases. Did you feel that? You feel it in the pit of your stomach, in your gut. What else? You stop breathing. Please start breathing again. You, you, you feel tense straight away. Did, did you hear all of that? Did anybody feel instant relaxation and, and, and a surge of, <laughs> of pleasure coursing through your veins? And what does that mean for the, for the process of learning? Because today I'm asking, what is it that makes us want to learn? Whoever said, oh, I can't wait to be examined. I can't, wait to go to, I can't wait to go to school today. I'm so excited there's going to be an exam where I will be examined. <laughs> and then there's the grading. Oh, look, I just had an idea, degrading. We should make a pun on that. That's still in process. Let me, I'll, I'll work on it for the next time. And I don't know, I have no idea. I'm sorry about that. I, I, I don't really know how it works in Canada, but... Um, I remember when I was in school in Uruguay, I went to a French school, the Lycée Francais, and every minute of every day, I remember being aware, and we all were, of where we stood in the class. Who was coming first, who was coming second, who was coming third. This thing of ranking and grading. And, and, and what they did socially was disastrous, because we all hated whoever was first and second. And it's no wonder that children felt that way because there's like a shame curve. The further down the hill you are, the more ashamed you are. And, and the flip side of shame is pride. And I don't think pride is like the good part. Um, and I think some of the most troubled kids are the kids that are being reminded how they're at the top and they're better than everyone else. And everyone thinks you've got nothing to complain about, but inside they're in turmoil, 
absolute turmoil. It's hard to be at the top. It's not a happy place. You know that the sense of connectedness with your brothers and sisters has been broken in that moment and you are looked at in, in, a, in, a, in a particular way. Remember that song? Everything you can do, I can do better. I can do everything better than you. I think I hit a couple of those notes kind of right. <laughs> do you ever feel like the, just the fact of quantification already presses the shame button? Do you feel that way, anybody? I, I, I do. I'm going to say this is an opinion right now because I'm not going to stand on top of research. But I've seen schools where the report card, the report card, and even when I say that word, the report card, I don't know about you, I hear shark music in the background. <laughs> yes, this is report day. Woo! Can't wait to bring this report card home that quantifies me into numbers and tells me how I compare to the other kids. I'm going to show that to my mum and dad. It's going to be so cool. <laughs> and they're going to look at me and say, but I love you unconditionally. <laughs> yeah. I've got this really cool book at home and the, and the book is called Could Do Better and it's got report cards of famous people like Woody Allen and, and John Lennon <laughs> and Winston Churchill. And they all totally sucked. I mean, the report cards, the report cards were just scathing about everything. But you know, there's all kinds of feedback is so important. Every kind of feedback, non-shaming, negative feedback is an act of love, I think. It's, it's how it's done. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But uh, I've seen schools that write a um, qualitative report card including your child has been learning a lot more about negotiating and has some new friends. You know, where social intelligence and emotional intelligence is addressed. By the way, I'm, I'm kind of concerned because I sound like I'm critical of school. And as you'll hear from the talk that I'm going to do this afternoon, I think Number one, the fact that we have schools and the fact that our kids go there and then the fact that we have a school that has a baseball thing over there and an auditorium like this over here, I think that is just utterly golden. And, and you'll know what I mean by the end of my, the talk that I'm giving this afternoon. Um, and it's also clear to me that, that how we do schooling has been evolving so rapidly in one generation it's just <laughs> transformed. But we're always looking for what's the next level of what we can do, right? So it's in the spirit of the next level that I'm talking. <laughs> Use force. When all else fails. This is what is now understood about shame because shame has become the subject of, of, um, uh, of so much more research and attention. Psychologists used to be very fond of talking about guilt and guilt is so passe and now we're interested in shame. But shame is huge. It's huge. It's profound and, and, and it's there in so many of the things that we do in and we don't do in our relationships. The impact of shame, and here's a good reason to try to protect our children from that. Because shame, that's another one of these assumptions that doesn't get questioned. And, and I would say most parents and teachers around the world would still just intrinsically believe, without even thinking it, that sometimes you have to put children to shame because without that they won't behave. Are you familiar with that idea? It's usually not even a consciously held idea. It's, just, it's unconscious. We live from that. 
Unless you shame a child, that child won't learn to behave well. The, the naughty boy, naughty girl kind of thing. There's a lot that can be said about that. As we understand, oh, forget it. I'll do that. Shame. Shame is that voice of the inner critic that follows us around everywhere. The, that little voice in the head that we can never seem to switch off. That, 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 that tells you somewhere along the line, oh, you won't, you won't make, you won't be able to do that. Or, you know, they're on to you. Um, what are some of the things that that voice says? You're not good enough. You're not good enough. Let's, you're not good enough. Etc. 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 I can't sing. Um, I can't do this. Um, if I stand up and speak to a group of Canadians, they'll all laugh at me. And you did. <laughs> it doesn't help. <laughs> when we're in shame, we become self-preoccupied. You lose a sense of the others. When shame is the motivator, we're acting on our own behalf. We're not thinking of group. It's not about relationship. It and, and it comes at the expense of the empathic connection. In other words, when I'm a good boy, to, to reclaim your approval of me and the pat in the head, this is so important because on the surface it looks the same. But when I'm a good boy for the, for the approval and to escape shame, I'm not doing the good thing because I care about you. I'm doing the good thing to get my numbers back up. I'm doing it for the applause or for the... Do you understand? And, and that is vital. It's so vital because empathically motivated good behavior is sustained. When we act out of love and out of care, it's, it's immediately pleasurable in the human heart. Good behavior that's motivated by shame or doing my homework or whatever it is <laughs> motivated by shame, that won't be sustained. It doesn't radiate out to other good behaviors. Does that make sense? Our capacity to stay focused and to, and to give things our attention in shame, it gets fuzzy. We, we lose our focus. We get cloudy. Performance goes down. There is definitely a loss of inventiveness and creativity. By the way, I'm not making this stuff up. I didn't want to bore you with research this and research that and a study done in 2011 by somebody called Rachmaninoff et al. whatever. In my book, there is uh, particularly Parenting for a Peaceful World, the first one, there is a huge bibliography there. And there's you and Google, Dr. Google. It'll get you there. But this is research-based, mainly, mainly uh, the brain research. Are you aware that there's a brain revolution going on at the moment? They can take scans of the human brain. They know which bits of the brain light up when we're in shame and what switches off. That's how they know that the, the, that rational, focused, logical thinking part of the brain it, it powers down when we're in high uh, emotion like shame or fear. The limbic brain takes over. Look, it just makes sense. You can't think straight in when your fight or flight mechanisms are switched on because you're not supposed to think straight in fight or flight. You're supposed to <coughs> run away quickly without thinking or to push back quickly without thinking. Does that make sense? This is evolution. 
I want to I make a special slide for this because one of the things that when kids have been shamed a lot, put down, one of the impacts is what they call shame rage. It is one of the several but powerful contributing factors to bullying behavior. And bullying is given so much attention and hallelujah to that. If it feels like there's a lot, there's like a bullying epidemic in schools, I don't think there is. What's happened is that for the first time, it's, it's being spoken about and people worry about it and there are uh, 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 policies about that in every school. There's even, you know, caring given to the bully, counselling, etc. So they're not just vilified. And why it's all over the news all the time is because in my day, bullying was just called going to school. It was just considered what happens. And it was horrible. But one of the contributing factors to bullying behavior, there's all kinds of things that contribute, but shame. Kids that feel deeply shamed, ashamed at the core. And, and are you familiar with, with uh, I mean, this is almost uh, iconic, that it's the kid at the top of the class that might be one of the targets. You know, and they're grading. Oh, that's right, the wand isn't working for me today. So shame, rage. Oh, please don't do that. Here we go. So, um, thanks to psychologists, wonderful industry, we don't punish kids anymore. That is passe. It's gone out of style to punish. Because what we do now is, is reward. Do, you, do, do they have the gold star system in Canada? Sure. You, yeah. you do, you don't. It's, it, 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 candy. Candy in class. <laughs> what would it take for me, for my teacher, if I'm in primary school, for my teacher to give me some candy at the end of the day? What would I need to do? Listen well. Listen well. How do you like that? So I'm, I'm listening for the candy. I don't give a stuff about what you're telling me. I'm just listening for the candy. <laughs> Show me the money. And this, in Australia, this is huge. There are some independent schools that have opted out of the system, but psychologists have gone everywhere and convinced all of the teachers. If you want kids to perform, shame them just a little, but mostly reward them for being good. And, and, and there's a whole currency. It's a very complex currency. And I know some, this is, you're going to love this, because I know some primary schools where they give gold stars, and you can accumulate your gold stars. You have an account. And when you've accumulated enough gold stars, you get to trade them in for lunch with the principal. <laughs> Which is filled with layers of meaning because the principal always, you know, obviously considers himself as a, as a prize catch. You know, because you get to go out to lunch with me. How cool is that? Now, I'm not sure about that as an incentive, but... but Either that or there's some really, really cool principles in primary schools now, which is not like how it used to be. You guys have one here, utterly cool. I heard that music. It was beautiful, actually. Very moving. Gorgeous. So this is what we do. We give big prizes because we're very new age now and very progressive. Right? Um... One of the best summaries of the research on the impact of this, this particular kind of reward system is in Alfie Cohn's book. I've summarized it further in my two books. Alfie Cohn's book is called Punished by Rewards. There's been a lot of research attention given to this recently, but, but the teachers aren't being told about it by the psychologists. So I'm hoping to, to change all that before my industry gets a, a really, really terrible name. This is what happens. The problem with secondary rewards. Psychology 101. 
the first thing that you learn about by training rats in year one is that if you're going to reward somebody for running the maze, you better make sure you've got a lot of rewards in, in your pocket. Because the first thing that's going to start happening when you start, stop handing out the, the candy and the gold stars is that the behavior you wanted it will extinguish. It's called behavioral extinction. I think the gold stars are something for an emergency situation when you add a loss as to what to do. But you need to know that emergency medicine has massive side effects, and here they are. In other words, if you want your child to love what they're learning and to do it for the love, those rewards at the end will spoil that, will actually interfere with that. When I'm being rewarded, paid gold stars or money or whatever it is for what I'm doing, this is going to be real interesting in a minute because I'm getting paid for what I'm doing today. <laughs> so please, somebody ask me, how does that work? Does that mean that we need to stop paying everyone? Uh, no, no, not yet. <laughs> it's going to get confusing, but we'll work, we'll work it out. The first thing that we do when we're getting paid more money, if someone says, I'll pay you more if you do, if you, if you do this much, I'm going to find a shortcut. I'm just going to find the quickest way to get to the money. Quickest way for the mouse to get to the cheese. And the easiest way. That will be my motivation. That's not just an idea, by the way. This has been researched quite heavily more recently. It breeds cheating. Doesn't mean everyone's going to cheat, but anyone in the class that is vulnerable to cheating under pressure, particularly kids that are suffering from a lot of shame, you're going to get more cheating when they're doing it for the money at the end. The money could be the gold stars, the candy, or the or good grades. You learn what you need to learn for the exam. You take the money and you run. And by the time you get home, you've forgotten everything. Because you were doing it for the money. Is this starting to make sense? The studies are showing that comprehension suffers when we're thinking of the end game rather than loving the moment of what we're doing. Was that a question or were you just stretching because a bit of yoga? Okay. I wasn't going to answer it anyway. <laughs> creativity goes downhill because creativity means taking a I just want to find the quickest way there. To be creative, you have to get really, really, really comfortable with getting it wrong. Getting it wrong needs to be, I think, absolutely glorified almost in the classroom, just to heal from 12,000 years of fear of getting it wrong. We tried so hard to find a school in Sydney that would do this. We found one for our daughter where she went to primary school. They had teachers there. It would look something like this. I'll make it up. Let's say early primary school. Let's do some sums. Five plus two. Can anyone tell me? And some kid would go 52 or whatever or, or, or eight. And I mean, the, the, the traditional impulse is to say is that's wrong. I mean, mathematically, it is wrong, right? Maths is one of these things. But the teachers were trained to do it differently and would say, now that's really interesting. You got 52 when you added 5 and 2. How did you come to that? What was the pathway of thinking that took you to that? I want to hear all about it. Invariably, that pathway was going to be useful for something. And you would end up saying, wow. Okay, now that wasn't the answer. That's not what 5 and 2 end up doing. But that pathway of thinking is going to be useful. It's interesting. It is interesting. And when you start to see that in action, you realize, wait a minute, wrong is actually of value. Wrong is, it's not what we were taught. Wrong equals shame in, in, in our cultural history. 
Isn't that right? Or should I say, isn't that true? I need to walk over this way, apparently. What happens when I walk that way? <laughs> now, this is wrong, but everyone's laughing. They're having more fun. So, wrong is a value. That's it. Kills innovation and risk taking, but I already covered that. How am I doing for time? Oh, oh my God. What time did I finish? That sounded like 10.30. Good. That means I have to talk really quickly. Let's talk about the workplace. So you grow up and you're an adult and you grow a beard or if you're a woman, you don't grow a beard and you, and you go to an office and you start doing your job or not at an office. And, and later on this afternoon, I'm going to talk about how childhood drives the way a society works. There's a massive link between childhood parenting education and what we get at the other end as the way societies function, business, international affairs. That's going to be real interesting. But let's look at what... So we, have this, we live in this culture where we have a belief that if you want to get good people working for you, just pay them more. So if you want a better executive, pay them more millions. That's why people like Goldman Sachs and Merrill Lynch and AIG, have you heard of those people? Were you around for 2008, 2009? Yeah. Are you aware that in the United States, what's the, what's the ratio of average CEO salary to minimum wage or, or no, average wage? I think it's 500 to 1. That, the highest ratio on earth. But the belief is so entrenched, as like Alfie Cohen said, it's so entrenched, you don't even question it anymore. You want better people, you pay them more. What actually happens, if you, want, if, you want, if you pay people more at that level, you just get people that want to be paid more. <laughs> it's not that we all need to be rewarded, but there's a difference between if-then rewards. What's the name of it? Daniel Pink, a book called Drive. Daniel Pink was the speech writer. He's a lawyer. He was a speech writer for Al Gore. Who knows Daniel Pink? Look him up in YouTube. He's great. He's, he's another one of my heroes. Daniel Pink is into business what Alfie Cohn is to school and education. Here's what happens if you say, I'm just going to pay you more if you meet those quotas or whatever, rather than something else, because it's a different kind of reward. Okay. Here's in research behind this. The first thing that's going to happen, if I pay you more to do better, you're going to enjoy your job less. It spoils enjoyment. It undermines performance. It actually undermines it. You don't do better because you get paid more. What a fallacy that's been and it's never getting questioned. Goodbye to creativity. Inhibition of risk taking, which is so important if you want to be innovative. It's all about getting it wrong and enjoying getting it wrong. <coughs> more cheating, more shortcuts. Hello, Wall Street. It's addictive. If I keep on saying to you, you're going to get gold stars or more money, whatever, that's going to be so much your motivation, you're going to feel terrible when you don't get that. I didn't say this, but it casts a shadow. It casts a shadow. Of shame. So if I don't give you the gold star and, and, and the big money that day, what happens is you go into shame, you get self preoccupied. Are you thinking about your kids right now and you know what what are the implications? Because that's that's when question time we'll we'll play with some of that. Is this information making you anxious? Uh, it, it, is that a yes? <laughs> We're going to work with that. Are you getting, uh, is it making you angry? Nope. Anybody? Nope. Why not? <laughs> it's eye-opening. Eye is this information getting you excited and thinking, oh, I'm going to do something with this later on? Yeah. yeah.
That was a very quiet yay. So we're going to work on that too. Oh, this is interesting to me. I think this kind of reward system, pride on the other side of shame, I think they're both faces of the same coin. It's a kind of divide and conquer. It sets you up to compete against one another rather than to think collaboratively, rather than to think as a team. The more preoccupied you get with your own winnings, the more it's about you rather than about us. Think of the consequences of that for everything, business, classroom, classroom and business, government. So here's what I think is the most important question that every learning environment should be asking and that everything that we do should be coming from this question. I feel a little bit kind of, well, I guess I feel this very strongly. It sounds authoritarian to say should, but I'd be dishonest if I didn't say, well, it, it, to me it does feel like a should. And, and I find this very exciting because um, I've got to tell you that I don't live up to my own ideas here all that well. And my daughter's a teenager now. She's about to turn 17 and she's doing her, um, she's finishing high school this year. And um, I can wave my flag about all this stuff up until my buttons are pressed, my own fears come up. And I noticed that especially when, when she was in primary school, my daughter was really into all of the, the good stuff like maths and science and not so much into art, for instance, the creative stuff. And um, I felt quite a bit more smug about this stuff. I just want my daughter to do what she loves. Look at her, she's doing what she loves, her maths and her science, dum de dum de dum and, um, and then she went to high school and it all flipped around the other way. And now she's crazy about art and design and I got a little bit more frightened and I could hear my own voice change to sound a little bit more like the voice of the teachers I had in school and the voice of my father. And I'd be asking more intrusive questions about her homework. <laughs> so, you know, I'm saying all of this stuff because I, 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 a big part of why, why I talk about this so much, it, it's what I need to learn. It, it's scary sometimes. And I've got so many of the old programs that still play inside me. How much, in other words, it's about trust. How much am I able to trust that when a child is in their passion, that it's going to be okay? That's not so threatening if your child's passion is IT. <laughs> Dad, I want to be a computer programmer. Son, you can do whatever you want. I'm not standing in your way. Dad, I want to play uh, electric guitar. <gasps> Don't listen to the talk, that talk about rewards and stuff from Robin Grill. So here's what I think and what I'm trying to learn and live up to is the most important question to ask. What do you love? I'm going to talk about examples of how that's can be done and it's being done. But I think the world is learning. The world is moving in that direction. Mainstream schools and, and independent schools. I hear so many people, mums and dads ask, how do I get my child to learn? What an incredible kind of a irony that is. When your kids became toddlers, when your babies became toddlers, do you remember the why stage? Mommy, Daddy, why is the sky blue? Oh, something to do with light refraction because of the moisture in the air or something and it breaks up the colors of light and the blue comes first or something like that. Oh, thanks, Mom and Dad. That's so interesting. What comes next? Ah. Mom and Dad, why does ice cream melt? Oh, because of... Uh, 
Oh, thank you, thank you. Why? Do you remember the, do you remember the endless why? Until you're tearing your hair out? Stop asking why. <laughs> and so, look at how kids are just desperate to learn about the universe. They'll drive you insane with their hunger and their thirst for learning. They're scientists. They're born that way. And then we go and ask the psychologist, how do I get my child to learn? Are you kidding me? How do you stop them? Is the question. It's, it's just, how did we get to that, having that question about our kids? Kids need discipline. They need a laboratory. They're going to tear that place up. So what's now understood about motivation, the motivation that is the real engine of learning and work. So this is about your workplace and your chores at home and your kids' schooling. Intrinsic motivation. Have you heard that expression? Intrinsic motivation. Now you've all heard it. This is really exciting stuff. It's a paradigm reversal. Most of humanity, most cultures around the world believed that to get someone motivated, to get someone out of bed, you need to punish them or reward them, shame them or, or pay them for it at the other end. Intrinsic motivation basically means when the substance of what you're doing, the process of what you're doing is feeding you, giving you meaning or pleasure or enjoyment as you go you're going to get to the outcome. If it's all about the outcome, and the outcomes are so important, if it's all about the outcome, that is really, I think that's kind of McDonald's motivation. It gives you the illusion of nutrition and it works a little bit in, a, in an emergency. But it's not really feeding you. Does that, how do you like that metaphor? Will I be sued after, <laughs> after saying that? So there's this new belief in the emergent curriculum. This is a buzzword, and I'm not a fan of buzzwords, but I need a buzzword so I can get through the day. And, and the emergent curriculum is just an approach where the curriculum emerges from the child. So really, is, it is anathema to standardization. And I come from a nation where it's getting more and more standardized, where every kid across the nation must get the same photocopied thing on their desk, and they're all learning the same stuff. And the fact is that almost zero teachers believe in that. It's people that don't know about teaching, that have never sat in the classroom, that are in government, they impose that. Did you know, incidentally, that the school, what is the country that's got the best performing schools in the world academically? Do you know it? Finland. Finland? <laughs> Finland and South Korea. Now, that's really, really interesting. Um, and, and it's true. Finland de-standardized. They decentralized education. They leave it to the teacher. And the teacher's going to talk to the students. They're going to say, what do you love? What do you love? So you're not all going to be doing the same thing. We'll group you with the kids that love the kind of thing that you love. And that becomes the vehicle of your learning through which you will learn all the stuff, all the literacies and numeracies that you're going to need to to meet the requirements of this society. If you love skateboards and that's your passion, that's going to be the engine. That's going to be the jet fuel, the high octane fuel. It'll be hard to get you out of this school to send you home at, when the bell goes at the end. And you're going to build skateboards and research skateboards and play with skateboards. And guess what? You're going to learn how to research and you're going to learn literacy and numeracy, but you won't know that that's what you're learning you're going to think you've got to be building a skateboard with your pals. And it turns out that half of the kids just like to sit at a desk and do sums. And that's okay. They like to do what people have been doing all along in schools, but some kids don't. The emergent curriculum is actually initially harder work for the teacher or the parent because it means getting to know each individual and helping the individual to find what makes them Tick, what is your passion? What is your passion? What do you love? What's the thing that you keep on, what's the thing you get obsessed by? What's the thing you keep on 
coming back to. And no, it's not just chocolate. Um, now, but the emerging curriculum makes the teacher very, very active. It's not just let them do whatever they want. And it's not just watch TV all day. It's where's your passion. So at the beginning, it's much harder on teachers. Then it's plain sailing. Okay, no, I'm exaggerating. But it's a, it's a much easier journey because you're not pushing, you're not coercing anymore. And this is true for parents at home as well. Your job is then to help the kids to be their partner, but they're driving the bus. And they push, man, they really go for it when the learning is hooked up to what they're on fire about. Then your problem is how to make them stop when it's time to eat or go to sleep. I was going to give you a couple of examples. Let me think if I can remember some anecdotes. I remember a teacher in, in, the, in the Harry Potter era, not that long ago for some of us, and the first movie was coming out and all the, all the kids was just like a craze. And um, I remember this one teacher at our daughter's school, everything she tried to teach for, for a couple of weeks, the kids weren't listening. And they were all showing each other the Harry Potter book under the table like this. And it was all very subversive and it was starting to turn out a bit like a traditional classroom, like the sort that I went to. And then, you know, the, the, the thing, the little light went on and she remembered, ah, look, I'm fighting against the kids and setting up conflict because I want them to learn stuff and not do this Harry Potter. She went, hey, are you, are you guys into Harry Potter? And the whole class goes, yes, okay, let's do some Harry Potter stuff. How would you like, and she negotiated, how would you like, let's just get together in groups and you're going to build a model, this is primary school, you're going to build a model, a model of the Hogwarts school from cardboard. And the kids went ballistic. <laughs> so what do you do? To build a model of Hogwarts College, you've got to read. But you're not just reading, you're, you are diving into it. You're researching this thing. You're fighting for the evidence, descriptive terms about this castle. And then you've got to negotiate and you've got to argue things through with your teammates. And you've got to use all kinds of measurement skills to work out areas and volumes. So suddenly you're an engineer, you're an architect, you're a research scientist, you're a journalist, you're a politician. She did the same thing with it. There was a craze that went through the school about fish and everything under the sea. So she put down all her plans and you need to be willing to let go of your plan. And life does that all the time anyway. And, and she said, right, look, you guys are crazy about fish. Who am I to argue? I just go on about fish. And they, they, there was a spare room to the side of the main classroom. It became the underwater room. They spent weeks researching every kind of underwater creature and, and, and building things around the room. There was sand on the ground. There was researching seaweed and drawing and everything. And, and through that process, it's inquiry-based learning, I think is the other term for it. Through the process, learning all the stuff that our society needs children to learn, to be really, really empowered. What the kids came out of that primary school with is... They don't know that teachers are supposed to be scary people. They don't know that learning can be really, really boring sometimes. And people would ask me all the time, you know, what, how does that, that's all very well. You can always tell when trouble starting because the sentence begins with, that's all very well, but here comes trouble. That's all very well and the kids are happy, but how does that prepare them for high school? And how it prepares them for high school is that these kids are the ones at the front of the room, not afraid of the teacher, asking all the questions and putting their hand up and engaging. I want to know more. I want to know more. Um, not taking things for granted. Why is it like this? Why is it like that? Why do you believe that? Are you sure you're right about that, teacher? Asking the questions, driving the learning. And when the teacher said, I've got some homework, everyone else groans, these kids go, give me some. This primary school, I mean, 
hold on a minute. Our primary school had lots of problems and lots of reasons why you should not send your child there. I don't want to idealize it or romanticize it. I'm talking about, I'm just using this as one of the many, many examples to illustrate uh, the point. They had a no homework policy, except uh, unless the, the children asked for the homework. And you'd be amazed how often they did. You would also be amazed how often the, 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 the kids during the school holidays would say, how long before we get to go back to school? You would also be amazed to hear when children would fake wellness. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. And sometimes they didn't, of course. So you've all heard about play-based education. I actually think that play and learning, I don't know why we have two separate words for that. I'd be interested to, to, to hear if other, other languages around the world have one word for the two. In mammals, which we all are, play is what learning is. Joy and infinite curiosity is, is in the design. That's what drives the learning best. Right? We have, when we're playing and playing and playing and playing and playing, when a child is in self-driven, imaginative play, just you don't need a lot of expensive stuff for that. They even understand now there's a, there's a part of the, of the rear brain which drives seeking and curiosity behavior. In play, that connects with the frontal lobes, which is the part that helps you to organize and to reach an outcome to take your creative impulses and to drive them through to a result. And in playtime, and by play, I don't mean PlayStation. I mean imaginative play, where the child's producing the play. And a class can be this way. Um, literally, the brain is building new neural pathways. It's adding flesh that connects the seeking part of the brain to the forebrain. That's powerful. So I'm going to kind of race through the end because I want to hear from you guys. Here's my Christmas wish list. This is what I'd like for schools to be. Heart-driven. So that, to move the curricula from just the national standard to, just to slide it along. Some standards are always going to be necessary. That's okay. But just to lean more towards emergent and negotiated curricula. Non-coercive guidance. You don't need to coerce kids 98% of the time. Sometimes we do. But I don't really know what that percentage is actually. I just know that we can do it a hell of a lot less because what moves people much more powerfully than anything else is the love and the passion. So motivation, remember, intrinsic motivation. Remember this for you. Think of all the chores that you hate doing. This is a challenge. And, and I say this because it's so much harder to pass this on to our kids when we don't have it in ourselves. Think of the things that you do in your life that you can't stand, that bore you. How can you have faith in the principle of intrinsic motivation and in your human right to have joy, pleasure, or meaning in what you do by turning around the way that you do it so that you're enjoying the process, not just the outcome of it? Mowing your lawn, working on your tax return, <laughs> vacuuming, what if those chores weren't trivial? What if you could use the doing of those chores in your life to challenge yourself about how can I make this more enjoyable? That is so important. That is not trivial. It is so, so very, very important because when you, to the degree that you get that in your bloodstream, that's when you have the faith and the willingness to be inventive and creative to pass that to your kids. 
I don't think it's possible that everything would be pleasurable. Not on this planet. What happens is when you find the, the, the meaning in something and you're doing it, and that inevitable moment comes up when you're not enjoying your work that day. Like, I love my work. Sometimes I don't. In my private practice, sometimes I have a really awful day. What is it that keeps me going there? Or when I'm doing all of the admin stuff, I'm working out the time schedules for my clients because I do private practice, or doing my tax return. Oh, God, it's unbearable. So there's, we're always having to put up with the menial. There's, a, there's, a, there's an aspect of that, right? But when, you, when you're doing the, the difficult stuff in the service of what you love, no one has to push you anymore. It's different. Even the unpleasurable is different. That's discipline. That is discipline. I was going to give you a little example. I hate doing my tax, and it's become more onerous in Australia. They just ask you to do more and more and more calculations. I can't stand it. Pardon? Sorry. I don't. If I hired somebody to do that for me, I don't think I don't think you could afford me anymore. That's the problem. That's the problem. Uh, you hire people and they want it to be paid. I show them this stuff and they still want to be paid anyway. But the thing is, thank you for the idea. I had thought of it. Um, uh, pardon? Probably. But I decided, look, I want to, I, just a little example of what, what I did because I can't hire somebody or I won't. What if I can make doing my tax something that I look forward to? I mean, that is a revolution right there. I decided two things. Now, this is an experiment. I decided two things. Number one, I'm going to use one of those, the running sheet, what do you call them? The ledger thingy on the computer. Spreadsheet, Spreadsheet thank you. I, I, it's got to have color in it. So I, I use one, a program that's got color in it. Already that's helping me. And I'm not kidding, it does. For me. I like, I, things have to look pretty. You know, hey, listen, you guys have a parliament house with Christmas lights on them. <laughs> so don't laugh at me for using colour in my spreadsheets. And try this. Try doing your tax to deep purple. It works. So that, I look forward to it now. This is my quiet time. It's not that quiet when I'm... But it's my alone time when no one's going to bother me and I'm going to just do sums and listen to Deep Purple or Crosby, Stills and Nash, whatever the mood is. I have to do yoga regularly. But I'm a very, very restless individual and I can't stand just doing this thing. So then I decided if I play, if I play heavy metal, and that is so unyogic. I think the yogis would just, I don't know, I'd be fired if they heard. But, I, you know, but it, it works, and now I really look forward to it. So it's not all about music. That's just my thing. What can make even the most onerous tasks? People say to me, I love mowing the lawn. I just love watching the, the length of the grass kind of disappear. <laughs> and I'm making these lines, and it's kind of a meditation. There's ways to turn your boring things into a meditation if you... Believe in your right to meaning and pleasure. Which means going against thousands of years of the, or hundreds of years of the Protestant work ethic in which you are valued for the amount of suffering that you're willing to put up with. Good on you, son. You've suffered well. I'm proud of you. You put up with the crap and ask for more. What if we were to slide on the continuum towards more cooperation rather than competition. Competition is fun. Some people like it more than others. I love to watch a good soccer game. But does everything have to be competition? You know, you can't even do a show on TV about food anymore 
Oh, listen, turn it into a bloody fight. Have you got MasterChef here? Oh, yes. I can't eat after watching MasterChef. <laughs> Everything's got to be a damn fight. What is that with these people? The Western culture. We've got to get over ourselves. It sells. It sells. Yeah, it sells. You get the money at the end, right? See how it all ties in together? Come on, let's have more fun. Goodness. <laughs> have you seen these movies? Yes. I'm talking about the kids. What about the teacher's right to have fun? Because it's one of the most incredibly stressful jobs, right? I mean, teachers have nervous breakdowns. And I think that mainly comes from above, from the policy makers. If you're in the classroom and the kids love what they're doing, then they love you. You feel loved. You don't feel like the bad guy in the room. I've seen, I've seen teachers be just moved in their hearts with, with how the classroom responds. And that's the teachers that decide, I need my job to be fun. And that then communicates to the kids, I need your job to be fun. I want some time to talk and I've, with you guys and I've talked too long. Can I just leave this slide up? Ah! Go back. How to get the kids to do even chores at home. What can you do to make the chores fun? And pleasurable. Doing stuff together. Singing a song while you do it. Competition can be fun. Make it into a race. I'll clean up my room, you clean up your room. See who gets there first. See, th this is... Intrinsic motivation means having to be creative. Because what works for you won't work for you. You're going to have to make it up. Ah! But you're only, you've only got one brain. We've got to have one group brain, though. This is called crowdsourcing. We're in the era of crowdsourcing. Ask a friend, how did you get your kid to love having bath, having their bath time when they were three years old? Ask around. You won't come up with all the ideas somebody else did. Someone else will. And you'll share your ideas with others. So you can make tasks more pleasurable, make them um, task ownership. Ownership is what's important. What do you want to do? Okay, you're in charge of the kitchen for one week and we'll renegotiate at the end. And you're in charge of whatever the bathroom. So you're in charge of mowing the lawn. It's yours. Task ownership. I'm so sorry I've run out of time to really go into some depth with these. But I always talk too much. I wanted to say just quickly, this is happening around the world in a big time. Big way. I think mainstream schools are moving towards the emergent curriculum. The teachers are trying to, even if the governments don't let them. The democratic education system, it all comes under different names. It's enormous in Israel. They've got at least a couple of hundred schools. They've all got waiting lists, the democratic schools. Um, in fact, I'll talk more about these later. In Japan, the free school system, hundreds of schools in the free school system. You always hear Japan and South Korea, um, incredibly rigid education, high pressure, but they've turned the opposite direction in Japan because it's causing so much bullying and school refusal. And now they have these schools that are run by the kids. And they decide what to learn and when to learn it and how to learn it. And they are so, so successful and it's bringing them back. You, you know, the, the schools that are, the kids that have been traumatized in the very rigid schools, they go there and they just come back to life. It's also, and I'll say more about this this afternoon, it is a treatment for social violence. I call it vocational healing. You get even a violent person to know what they love and to give them opportunities to do it and to hone it, to rehearse it, to develop it. And it's been found over and over and over again, violence will reduce. It's been used in Israel for violent schools. They come in, they, they democratize the education and it takes about two years and the kids stop bullying each other. God, so many stories I could tell you about that. Ask me more at lunchtime. Am I being, this is my stage manager, I'm being told to, we're going to commercial. Well, What's you, going on? I heard you wanted to take a few questions. Yes, let's do that now. That. Good, thank you.
I won't say any more. Yes, you will. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Question time. So hang on, right after John. So, so um, first thing I want to say, Rob, yeah. is I was listening to your conversation about Alfred Cohen and the idea that uh, money does not create enjoyment, it spoils enjoyment. So I have to assume you're having a lot more fun than him because he charges a lot more money. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. You talked you talk about shame, and shame yeah. is used frequently to generate conformity. And yes. It must work to some degree because we keep doing yes. it. And uh, yep. that being the case, how do we change it? How do we change those non challenged beliefs that you talk about to get to a paradigm shift? Yes. Shame. I'm going to deliberately use language to differentiate shame from humility. Shaming does work to change behavior. So, so does punishment. In the immediate moment, if I shame you enough or frighten you enough, there's a good chance that you're going to change your behavior while I'm watching. It's the long term where it doesn't work. It's the potential for backlash where it doesn't work. Uh, and it's, you know, right now, even forget the research, use your instinct. What would you prefer? That if I'm your child, that I'm going to be a good boy now to avoid the shame or that I'm going to be a good boy now because I care about you and it gives me some pleasure. It feels good in my gut and in my heart to contribute and to treat you with respect. Which one of those two do you prefer? It's kind of like shame works, a cattle prod would work, but what's the definition of work? How do we stop doing it? How do we stop doing it? That is such a big question. Let me see if I can miraculously find a short answer. Because, yeah, 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 yeah. I'll talk about that in this afternoon. Because to give up something, you need to have a really good alternative. Otherwise, it's just giving up something. That is probably the most important question, John, because everyone is saying, stop smacking your children. But the thing is that behavior is chaotic. And we need boundaries. And in fact, we more than need them. They're absolutely central. Behavioral boundaries are absolutely central in school and at home and in the playground. How do we set a strong boundary? How do we assert a boundary? without using shame or punishment. What works but works in the long term without the backlash? And it is something about emotionally authentic communication. We do need to let our kids not just hear but see when we are, when we feel upset with what they've done. We need to show that. If you want your child to have empathy for you, you need to give them something to have empathy for in you. And this is dangerous because you can use your anger to intimidate or terrify. And then it's not going to work. But at least to say, when you do that, I feel hurt. When you do that, I feel annoyed. Whatever your truth is, we do need that. And then the product is, I think, qualitatively different to shame. It feels different. It's humility. And we all need humility. The difference being that shame is a completely narcissistic 
state. It's not about the other person. Humility is when we realize I'm not as big as I thought I was. I'm not as special. I'm not as special as I thought I was. You're important to me. That's the distinction I would use. Who's next? Are you next? Um, yes, my, sure. my question was about, um, I was wanting to talk about shame again. So I, what I understand from you, we're, not, we're talking about humility as the replacement for shame. Is that what you were just saying? In the context, yeah, humility is the replacement for shame in the context of boundary setting. Because I think uh, at a lot of points in our life, we probably learn from our shame. And um, not to say that shame is good or bad, but are there any benefits at all to shame? Yeah, I get, are there benefits to shame? That, that tends to be a semantic issue. There's some people that talk about healthy shame. Healthy shame as opposed to toxic shame. People like John Bradshaw uh, painted that way. When children are very small, yeah. um, and they want you to do something. And then shame because of your displeasure with what they're doing, they feel shame. So you're saying you, know, you don't want them to go in a pond. Is that is that the example? Whatever. No, no, that's a good. It's good to have an example. Um, your child's going to a pond. You know that that pond is there. They have to run. They can't go to the pond. Yes. Um, you're mad at them. That's that's got to be a Canadian reality, not to go in the pond. <laughs> because ponds are cold. Ponds are cold. I understand. I want them to be afraid of the pond. Me too. To Me too. So I, I'm, I, I'm glad you want your child. I'm going to be in really big trouble if they don't get the fear. They have to understand the fear. You know what else happens though? You know what else happens when, let's say I'm a kid. And if my motivation not to go in the pond is because I'll be in trouble. At least a third of the kids will go to the pond because you said that I'm going to be in trouble. <laughs> and that, that's that's where things. I, I know that we use shaming in a state of emergency. Like it's, this is serious business. Going in a pond, someone could get really hurt or worse. I understand that. You know, and some some of the things that come out of me spontaneously. If my little girl is running near a highway, I'll. I'll yell, I'll shame, I'll do, you know, I'll do things that, that are not what I plan to do. I, that, that's so true. And then afterwards I find myself having to repair all of that. Half of the kids, when we say well, you'll be in trouble, and the threat, half of the kids will then rebel. They'll find a time to oppose you, rebel, uh, do the opposite go and smoke, and half of the kids will not rebel but become incredibly compliant and submissive to the request, but they're doing it for you. They're doing it for the mummy voice in the head or the daddy voice in the head. And you can have better than that. I'm just saying, well, that'll save their life sometimes. The alternative, and I'll, I'll expand more uh, this afternoon, and I want to say that the alternative is, is, a, is, is a language to learn. I'm still learning it. I'm still learning it, and and it's not easy. It's not going to be a little. We'll struggle with it, but I, I will define it. I want to define what that is because I want you to know that there is an alternative. It exists. It is being used, and it would be a hundred times more powerful than the old way. And it is this. Let me say it. It is the emotionally authentic communication. You said you would like your child to be afraid to go in the pond. Show them that. It's vital that you show them that. You don't fall on the ground and scream in terror, but you say, hey, I'm afraid. I'm afraid of what can happen. And that, that's why evolution invented fear. Fear is good. It's not when we're paralyzed from it and we can't mobilize, but you need some. You need a homeopathic dose of fear so that you're careful. That's why we have 7 billion people. We've been pretty careful, except now we're doing it all wrong. But that's another story. <laughs> so do, do you get that? Look, my daughter used to put her fingers in, in the door jam all the time and it used to freak me out. 
It used to freak me out. So I said, look, I'm so... That scares me when you do that. Please don't do that and be thoughtful. I want to show you what happens. I didn't say you'll be in trouble. I want to show you what happens. And I took a pencil and I put it in the door jam and closed the door and the pencil broke. And she, she freaked out. She burst out crying. I didn't, intend, I, I didn't know it was going to be that scary. But I picked her up and held her and said, look, that's, that's what can happen to your finger. And it has happened to your finger once. It, it's worth being afraid about the completely dangerous things. So that works for communicating fear, communicating annoyance, communicating pride, making an I statement. It just it is so much more powerful and your kids hear you so much more deeply. They embody your message. When instead of saying, bad boy, you'll be in trouble, you say, this is how I feel. Notice how I feel. Or instead of saying, good boy, Good girl, bravo. If you say something about you, I'm proud of you. When I saw you do whatever it was, playing soccer the way you played soccer, or singing, the, playing the violin, the, I was moved. I loved listening to you, seeing you. I was excited. You speak about, you, you show the transparency about your feelings. Okay? Try that. Try this at home, and you probably already do it half the time and you don't realize it. And in fact, that works better. That's been working all along for you already. Um, don't look at your watch. <laughs> How many more questions am I allowed to take? Uh, we prefer that we don't have any more. Does anybody have a couple quick questions we could do just really fast? Two, two little ones. Really quick one? Okay. You guys have a mic. Because we want to have time for people to talk time. to him privately. Sure, I'm going to... Hi, my name is Margaret, and um, you were talking um, about how teachers or parents uh, would be the most effective to create a situation where the children can learn in fun environment, creative, and so on. And then you were talking about the situation where at home, um, when the children learn by themselves, or in the future when they become adults and they have to make their taxes fun. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious how you would make a connection between a student who at school is always provided by the teachers with this fun, creative environment, and every day expects it. A, a, a teacher that is always a teacher that's always creating that fun environment, yes. and the student starts expecting it every day. Comes to school and it's not fun, and the student is bored and demands it. And um, you know, we parents sometimes talk about this development of sense of entitlement in children because of that. So how do you go from that point where you provide um, the entertainment, the payment, the creativity to children's environment, and then how they, how do they become those self-creative? Thank you. Really, really interesting question. What if you got a teacher that is so much fun, and then your te your, your your child starts feeling entitled to fun, and then how do you, you know, that's setting a very high bar for you at home. I can't make everything fun. You know, I've got. So that's a very, very interesting question because the first thought that came to mind is why, why shouldn't we all be entitled to fun? Why not? And this is a, a, an open question. It's an open question. I, I don't necessarily know the answer, but, but I feel something about that. Why can't you and I, not, never mind our children, why can't you and I have more fun with what else, whatever it is that we do. For me, this, this question brings up a lot of pain, a, a lot of a sense of tragedy. Because in my private practice as a psychologist, I, I meet with so, so many people that discover at 30, 40, 50 years of age, I became a lawyer, whatever it is, because my mom said that I should or my dad said that I should, and maybe because I was able to. I really don't love it. And that, that just breaks my heart every time I hear it. And I, probably most people, at least half of the people in the world, are doing something because, oh, you know, you're, you, you, can, you can be a secretary, you can be a teacher. Uh, or, or there's lots of jobs in mining. Go, go in the coal mine. That's an Australian thing. There's more money there. Go in the coal mine. And then ruin the environment for everybody else. You know, so... That impacts, to some degree, our belief 
in the right to enjoyment. I want to say also that fun isn't always ha ha ha, let's climb trees. What I mean by that word fun, have you heard of um, a book called Flow? It's brilliant. I can't pronounce the guy's name. Mihaili Chikjent Mihaili. He's from the Czech Republic. And those people have so many consonants and everything that they say. And he talks about flow, that moment where you get so absorbed in what you're doing, you're lost in it, and you forget what time it is. You literally forget there's no time anymore. You're lost in what you're doing. And you, you, in, in that state of fun, one more, in that state of fun, you can look very serious, very, very serious. Now, then your child comes home, I've had fun all day, mum, make it fun for me. If you want me to help you with taking things off the table after dinner, make it fun. Um, you're not under pressure that way. First of all, do so because you can and because you'll have more fun. Not, not just to... Ask around. That's the second thing I want to say. Ask around. When you run out of ideas, how can I make this more enjoyable? There's 100 people here, 200 people here, and there's all of your community. We need other people's ideas. Our own will fail us. Third thing I wanted to say to you, it's not all upon your shoulders. Be honest with your child. Right now, I don't want to be responsible for your fun. I'm tired or I want to have my own fun, which means reading quietly. And then your child gets a moment of, if this is to be fun for me, I have to invent it myself. Allow that moment of tension. I mean, all our children need to know that we don't, we're not... We're not the fountain of their joy. That, that's the only way that they can find their own fountain internally. But my teacher provides all the fun and you don't because you're a bad mum. Okay. Well, we'll go halves in the therapy when you grow up. But in the moment, what, what do you do, son or daughter, when, when I can't be your fun machine? Use this time creatively. What, 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 what can you do to make this more fun for yourself? Trust, trust your child. Yeah. So you're not to entertain your child and to provide joyful engagement. And that's at school, and, and that means work. It's not just. Or, play. yes, like, good. Playing does. It's an entertainment or making it fun for them. It's giving them the opportunity to find joy. Correct. And I use that term fun in my own meaning. It's not about entertaining, it's, it, that's one, one strand of fun. There's a thousand more. And it's either about letting them entertain, giving them the opportunity to make things entertaining for themselves, or absorbing. Let's use that word instead, absorbing. We have time for one more question. We do yeah. not. We do not. We do not. Okay. Thank you.